All right. So uh, the question that uh, I was talking about is how come uh, images can be compressed very efficiently or videos can be compressed very efficiently, whereas uh, we are not able to compress some certain data types like textual data maybe, uh, not as uh, efficient as uh, images. The reason be, uh, uh, that lies underneath is uh, the redundancy of those data types. They are very redundant and it's something very information theoretic. Uh, I want to make this kind of a comparison uh, here. Let's think of a very uh, modest uh, one megapixel okay, uh, image that uh, we may come up with. It is a small image, even for today's telephone standards. So uh, 1000 by 1000, sort of 1 million pixels, 1 megapixels. And let's further assume that it's grayscale, it's not even color. For color, you just have to multiply everything uh, by uh, three, uh, and it's also very uh, low number of levels. It's only 256 levels, which means eight bits per pixel. So it's eight bits per pixel, one million pixels. So it makes eight million samples, eight million samples. This eight, eight million samples, um, uh, eight, eight million um, bits. I'm sorry about that. Let me correct it. Eight million bits can be constructed in uh, so many different ways. How many different ways? It is uh, two to the eight million. different um, images, let's say, I different uh, images. And if these images are one megapixel images, if, if they are larger, they, there would be more. But even for uh, one megapixel images, grayscale, <coughs> grayscale, we have two to the eight million different images that is available, you can construct. And this is way more than, normally they put two greater than signs, but I'm just, you know, uh, uh, in order to emphasize how great a number this is, this is way more than uh, the number of um, nucleons or any kind of particles in the whole known universe, okay? It's huge. It's actually more than to the power of itself times uh, the number of uh, particles in the universe. So this is amazingly huge. However, now let's think of how many images we could have uh, in the world. Uh, all the images that have been taken, the, I'm talking about digital images or digitized images, nevertheless, and all the images that will be captured um, within decades. So everything I'm talking about, all the images that are available to us. How many people are there in the world? Maybe 7 billion or something. Um, let's say... Uh, 10 billion, what's a billion? Um, it is, uh, let me not put it that way, it is 10 to the power uh, nine is a billion. And let's assume that every uh, body in the whole world has 1 million um, images, everyone. Of course, not everyone has 1 million images. I'm trying to exaggerate. But let's assume that everyone has 1 million images that would make um, each of these times 10 to the 6, which would be 10 to the 15. All right. Possible images. 
and that is briefly two to the power three, like two to the forty-five. Uh, excuse me, forty-five images may exist. Look at that, two to the forty-five, and this is the previous one is. Excuse me, two to the uh, eight million. So we can make this many images with our uh, construction alphabet, the pixels. Actually, we can make more, much more than this one, but I'm trying to reduce it as much as possible in this case. So this is a minimal representation and this is a maximal representation. And look at the difference between these two. So only a few of possible images are reasonable images, in other words. And therefore, there is always a reasonable mapping from here to here to make the compression. That's why, uh, for instance, images can be compressed very well because uh, information-wise, it is so redundant. The, the representation is capable of showing this many images, whereas uh, actually only this many of them are meaningful. That's the availability of, it, it, it shows the gap between the actual representation and the possible uh, compression uh, data size. Clearly, we cannot do this. I mean, uh, we're not in a technology to make this kind of a huge compression, but nonetheless, we are doing uh, pretty well. But there is still a gap, so you can even find uh, better and better compression ratios. And compression is also for bandwidth purposes. That's uh, also why that also explains why uh, for um, multimedia types of uh, signal transmission, the data transmission speeds are ever increasing because of this compressibility, because we are using mostly images, speech, and video. For videos. Just think of uh, one images here, but we have several such images and only a, a fraction of those will be available for us uh, as um, reasonable videos. Otherwise it will be just like noise. So the, the gap between um, reasonable videos and uh, the size of the uh, video is even larger. The gap is even larger than this. So that's why we are uh, capable of compressing, compressing data. That is something that I would like, I wanted to mention about. Now, um, let's start talking about the uh, today's topic, today's initial topic, which is lossless compression. If you may remember, that was the final stage of a, a three-stage compression um, formalism. The first part was transformation or prediction, which is playing around with the data itself to reduce its uh, layout, to reduce its entropy. And then we usually quantize it uh, for uh, incorporating the amount of loss. And then the last stage was uh, the lossless compression. So we're talking about the, that last part. Um, now, lossless compression is um, the uh, art of uh, making representation of individual symbols or groups of symbols which are efficient. So uh, lossless compression will uh, have two parts. The first part will uh, state that the code is efficient. And the second part is about decodability. Um, decodable. Because if you uh, push it too much uh, to the efficient side, it may become uh, non-decodable. Um, for example, uh, let's think of the, 
the Morse code. I'm, since I don't memorize the Morse code, I'm looking at my notes for some uh, certain uh, Morse code elements like E is represented with a dot and T is represented with a dash and A is represented with a dot and dash and M is represented with two dashes. Uh, R is represented by a dot dash dot. D is uh, dash dot dot. J is represented with dot dash 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 and V is dot dot so this glitch sometimes it makes dot 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 dash so these are the um, first few letters that we have but these letters uh, uh, ha have different amount of uh, code words uh, or code lengths for example, E has a code length of one, T has a code length of one, A has a code length of two. It, it is so efficient that it cannot be decoded because, for example, if uh, you encounter, let's say, uh, dot dash dot, it may correspond to E, T, and E. It may correspond to... Um, a and E, it may correspond to R, right? These are all possibilities. So which among these is uh, the transmitted meaning? It's not decodable, uh, to put it uh, this way. And there is a reason to that. There is a test for decodability. Uh, that decodability uh, test for the Morse code, uh, we will see that it just fails because the, the, the average uh, or expected uh, code word uh, length for the Morse code um, violates the condition of decodability. So this is not satisfied, it's not decodable. But we want to uh, be able to decode these things. Or uh, be because in computers, um, uh, normally we only have algorithms. Uh, we don't expect intelligence. Nowadays, computers may also come up with some machine intelligence. And that is, by the way, a very inspiring uh, subject the, to think about in terms of even compression. So machine learning may also be used for uh, compressing data uh, but that is something that we will not cover, and I strongly advise you, uh, students, to focus your uh, research ideas, if you may, uh, towards the machine learning way of uh, making compression. That may uh, come up with some astonishing results, including compression down to the Morse code, for example, which is not possible with classical ways. It's not decodable. Uh, for algorithms, but it is, for example, decodable for uh, human beings because human beings have a priori information. It's not the entropy that we uh, write uh, for humans. Of course, entropy is also a valid criteria for human beings, but human beings are better than that. They have conditional entropy. We have a priori information, some knowledge of the language. We know that, for example, the, the person that is typing on the other side uh, with this Morse code is another human speaking English, let's say. So we expect the outcome to be uh, of English, English language. And only one of those possibilities for the decoding will be corresponding to an English word, and we will decode it that way. That's a very smart move uh, for human beings. And if computers can also have that kind of uh, an intelligence, a machine intelligence or a native intelligence, whatever, of course they will be uh, able to uh, decode with better compression, maybe, hopefully. Now, when we look at this part, 
just these examples, we no start noticing something. Uh, and we start noticing the idea of uh, what makes an efficient compression and what was the idea of uh, Morse to construct this Morse code. Clearly, he had one thing in mind. This E, for instance, is consisting of only one symbol. Since there are two symbol, it's, it's symbols, it's symbols, uh, this is a binary code. You can think of them as zeros and ones. So this is one bit. Uh, why is it chosen to have lower number of bits? Because uh, E is very frequently encountered in the English language. It's the most commonly encountered letter. The next is T, by the way. And then comes A. I'm not sure about the others. Uh, I just gave them as examples, but uh, I'm not sure about the frequency, how frequently they are encountered in the English language, but it is sorted. In a, in a sense. And the most frequently encountered ones have smaller um, codes with fewer bits. The least free, uh, frequently encountered ones are uh, represented with longest uh, bits, for example, uh, J or V. So E has one bit and uh, J has four bits. What is the reason of that? It's the frequency, it's up to the frequency. So it's the first idea that we will come up with, uh, we have to have fewer bits uh, for <clears throat> um, more frequently encountered, encountered symbols. Symbols here are the letters anyway. But but at the same time, Morse was trying to be as decodable as possible, or the, although uh, he didn't uh, obey the rules of uh, complete decodability, uh, he was trying to be as decodable as possible. So not only this, he also wanted to uh, have the less frequently encountered symbols to have longer uh, symbols, to have longer number of bits because that is the necessary condition for decodability, because the average bit rate has a lower bound. And that lower bound is due to the uh, Shannon's entropy definition and things like that. Otherwise, you may ask this question, we may uh, want to have uh, fewer bits for more frequently encountered symbols, and we may also want to have fewer bits for even uh, less frequently encountered symbols. Why not, right? But that's not true, of course. That's uh, violating the uh, <clears throat> the lower bound condition. <clears throat> Although, again, as I say, Morse code is already violating the lower bound. Uh, he was trying to do his best uh, for decodability. It's not totally decodable, but it is way de more decodable than saying that E is dot, T is dash, and the others are not uh, necessarily four uh, symbols or uh, five symbols long. And what is the minimum amount of necessary bits? So the question is, or the answer is the minimum amount of um, bits necessary to encode a sim signal or a symbol. And that is given by the uh, mutual information due to uh, Claude Shannon. And that is the information of symbol um, N, let's say. And symbol. We have uh, several discrete symbols. Uh, we're talking about discrete symbols, like letters here. And this mutual information is given as, since we are talking in terms of bits, it means we have two symbols. If uh, we are talking about uh, some different way of representing the information, which is very unnecessary because computers talk uh, and the communication talks in binary. <clears throat> so bits is okay for us. The, the mutual information is 
the negative of logarithm base two of probability of this nth symbol. This probability is between zero and one, therefore its logarithm is negative and negative of that thing will give you uh, the minimum uh, amount of bits. Now this minimum amount of bits, uh, for example, if the uh, probability of this nth symbol is one over two, so half of the time we encounter a symbol and half of the time we encounter other symbols. So it's probability when we make uh, an estimation by counting, by uh, measuring the histogram, for instance. Uh, is one over two. So half of the symbols are consisting of this nth symbol, then what will be the necessary number of bits for the, its representation? Minus logarithm base two of one over two. And two, one over two is two to the minus one. And logarithm of two to the minus one is minus logarithm of two. And logarithm of two in base two is one. So it will give you one. So if half of the time you come up with uh, a symbol, if half of the time you come up with that symbol, then uh, the mutual information of that symbol is one bit and you can represent it with one bit and it contains an information of one bit. That kind of uh, a situation happens like this. Let us say that we are communicating and I'm here having a, a coin and I'm flipping that coin <clears throat> and uh, telling you if it is head or tails, but you don't know, you don't see, you cannot see the, uh, my desk. Uh, it falls onto the desk, it's either uh, head or tail and you don't know it, so I have to tell it to you. The amount of information that I'm transmitting to you after each uh, coin flip will be one bit. I will say either zero or one. Zero may be for head and tail will be represented with a one, for example. So I will tell you one bit. The information amount of that will be one bit. Why? Because the, the probability of head is one over two and the probability of tail is also one over two. But we may have more than that. We may, for example, come up with uh, a dice. I may roll a dice, six-faced dice. And then a number comes between one and six. And I have to indicate that to you. <clears throat> what is the information amount that I have to transmit to you? How many bits? You can open your uh, mic and say it. I'm waiting for an answer from your side. How many bits are necessary? for transmitting this information of six possible outcomes. Nobody? Is it six? Is it six? Six bits? Mm -hmm. No, it's not six bits. Uh, I think it is three. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is three. Three bits because what you have to look at is two to the power, right? So two to the power one was two. That's why for two possibilities, one bit is okay. You have to look at the logarithm base two of six, in other words. But logarithm base two of six is two point something, which it's not uh, really three. Uh, so there's some sort of inefficiency over there. But uh, if you have to represent every symbol individually, if you don't, do not combine or stack the information in series, but say that every time I roll a dice, it's that number, I'm telling you that number, for that purpose, I need three bits. Of course, for an eight-sided uh, prism shape, uh, it will be the same. Again, uh, three um, bits would be necessary. So you have to take a look at perhaps this, uh, the, the floor of, uh, sorry, the ceiling of minus logarithm base two of probability of SN for individual symbols. All right. So that is 
for um, equal probabilities. But what would happen if uh, equal probabilities are not encountered? That is, um, it, it's, it's a flawed or a biased dice. Say that six comes more than the others. Then of course, uh, the number of information that is being transmitted should be adjusted appropriately. For instance, most of the time it will, it is, uh, you can expect that it comes six, but sometimes of course, one, two, three, four or five will also come, but in, with a more probability six will come. So more of the outcomes will be six. Wouldn't it be wise if I assign less uh, number of bits for the representation of six? Because every time I say six, if I use less number of bits, then probably uh, I will benefit from that because I'm saying six very frequently and I'm using fewer bits over there. Then the bandwidth will be small. Or if I write these bits on a disk, then uh, the disk file size will be smaller. So that um, is depending on how to minimize uh, the so-called average uh, bit rate. And that average bit rate is represented by uh, this entropy that is notated by H. It's not the mutual entropy, but the entropy of the whole system. This S, let's, let me put it in, with an uppercase. It includes all the symbols from S1 to S capital N. Let's say that there are capital N different um, symbols or outcomes to be transmitted. That is um, P S I logarithm base two of P S I. That is the, uh, the mutual information multiplied by the probability with a negative of course. And that those things are summed up for all I from let's say uh, one up to capital N if there are N uh, symbols. This is called the entropy. And it also gives you an idea about the average bit rate. Now you may uh, ask this question. Previously it was only <laughs> negative of logarithm PSI, uh, the probability, the negative of the logarithm of the probability. But now I'm uh, multiplying it with its probability as well. This shows us how many of the times uh, we uh, come up with this symbol of SI. This is, th that gives us the probability. The reason that we would like to give um, a shorter uh, bit, uh, a shorter representation for a biased uh, dice, an unfair dice uh, for six, for example, is because this probability of six, symbol six is larger. So this larger number should be multiplied with a smaller number so that this overall average is effectively smaller. Now this, Entropy, here's a question for you. H of S is largest if probability of SI for all I are the same as one over N. So if they have all equal probability, this entropy is the largest. And for all, uh, let us denote this entropy as H of S equal, okay? And for all, all other probability distributions, notice that the probabilities of uh, SIs must add up to one, of course, okay? Probability of S1 plus probability of S2 plus probability of S3 plus up to probability of SN is equal to one. Um, and therefore, H of S is always less than or equal to H of SE. H of SE is the maximum. This is the highest entropy with uh, equal probabilities. 
uh, I may uh, ask for the curious, I may even ask uh, this kind of a question. So the questions that you will expect in take home examinations will be similar to this one. For example, can you prove this? Right? Of course you can. It, it, it's, uh, it is very provable and the proofs actually exist. You can find them. Uh, you, you, you may want to check out those things. Since this is not an exam question, you can do that. Even if it's an exam question, you can do that. But you cannot just copy the answers from uh, the resources. You can um, watch the uh, videos for that. You can look at the proof, try to understand. And once you understand, you write your own answer as a repetition. That's the way that you learn it. As you see, uh, examinations, homeworks, they are all uh, for the purpose of learning. Uh, otherwise, an exam is not for torturing purposes or for giving you different grades or things like that. You can all get A's if you all learn. The, uh, the idea is that you learn. And this is an uh, important uh, thing to, uh, to, to know. Uh, the entropy of equal probability is the largest. And if that kind of an equal probability case occurs, usually the lossless compression uh, schemes uh, are not capable of compressing. So this is usually, this case is, I would say usually not compressible. Uh, in at least symbol-wise compressible. You may think of combining the elements into uh, forming vectors. You may think of making predictions and afterwards trying to compress. But if you're just applying uh, the symbol-wise best symbol like Morse code, if you're trying to find the Morse code of these things, if they have equal probability, you cannot really compress them. You just have to assign um, uh, th this kind of uh, bits. Um, minus logarithm of uh, 1 over n bits, which is actually equal to logarithm of n bits, right? You must assign logarithm of n bits for each. For example, what did you say when uh, I asked the question of, it's a six-faced dice that you roll, how many uh, bits are necessary for uh, mentioning about the outcome, what's the information? The information is logarithm of six. Logarithm of six is logarithm base two, of course. Let's write it like this, because we are saying bits. Logarithm base two of six is uh, not uh, an integer number, it, uh, but you must floor it and say that three bits are necessary for this. All right. But uh, we can do better than this one. Now, I want to uh, mention about from here, proceed with uh, so the concept of so-called uniquely decodable. Um, codes, let's say. What makes uh, something a uniquely decodable code? I'm talking about binary codes here. Uh, don't worry about the fact that usually in computers we write in terms of bytes, even as uh, longer bytes uh, of 8 bits, 16 bits, sometimes 32 bits. But uh, computers talk in binary anyway, so uh, we will talk about bits, not bytes. So we will just, at the end, we will come up with a bit stream. You can just stack those uh, bit stream uh, sequence to eight bit chunks and combine them and come up with a byte and then write it to that, write that uh, byte uh, to the disk or transmit it for uh, communication purposes. So uh, bitwise coming up with a code is okay for us. It's uh, fine. If something is uniquely decodable or not, 
um, can be checked uh, with some with some um, nice mathematical tools. I will show you one example of uh, doing that mathematics, but it does not guarantee the, that you come up with a decodable code. It means that you can construct cle uh, cleverly a code that can be decodable if you obey that uh, length of code rules. And what is that um, uh, code length uh, rule? That uh, code length rule is, uh, let's give an example of four code uh, case. Let's say that, that we have four symbol case. They are not codes. A1, A2, A3, and A4. And the probabilities for these are 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, and 0 0.125. And as you see, they must add up to one. Now, this is a very um, nicely distributed uh, prob probability. It's a very nice uh, probability distribution because as you see, all the probabilities are in the format of two to the power something, like uh, two to the power minus one is 0 0.5, two to, the two to the minus two is 0 0.25, and two to the minus three is uh, 0. 125, they, uh, one of them is, they, they are one over two, one over four, and one over eight, in, uh, respectively. Now, suppose that I'm coming up with some codes. Let's say this is code number one that I'm uh, trying to represent. This is zero. So to A1, I give a bit symbol of zero. And to A2, I also give a bit uh, of zero and then to a3 I give the bit of one and then to a4 that is one zero. Now this average bit rate from here you can uh, calculate it like this. It is um, the probability which is one over two times this length which is one. One over two times um, one uh, plus one over four times this, plus one over eight times this, plus one over eight times this. That is the average bit length. And the average uh, bit rate for this happens to be 1.125. Uh, uh, too small, right? I'm using almost one bit per, per uh, symbol. Now the other one is code two, clearly you can see that it's not decodable. It's not uniquely decodable because if a zero comes, you don't even know whether it's a one or A1 or A2, it's so obvious. But sometimes um, the situation is even uh, more complicated. For example, it may be zero and one and then zero, zero, and then one, one. And the average for this one is 125. Okay. By the way, uh, okay, yeah, I see. Uh, we have to also evaluate the entropy of this uh, source, and I will do that. This code 2 is also not uniquely decodable because when 1 1 comes, does it mean A2 and A2 again, or is was it an A4? Or equally, if 0 0 comes, is it an A1 and A1 again, or is it an A3? So if a sequence of bits may arrive, you don't really have uh, any means to decode it. This code three one here is zero one zero one one zero one one one. And the average is 175 average bit rate. When you calculate, you will find it this way. Now the question that you may ask is, uh, are, is this code uh, uniquely decodable? And the answer is yes, it is. Let's think of it. Let's think of an example. For instance, uh, first I say one one zero, then one zero, one one one, and then one zero, and then zero, uh, one zero, one one zero zero, one one. Uh, one, 
zero. Okay. Now, can you decode this code without any ambiguity? Is it uniquely decodable? Is there any way to decode it in a, in a different manner? So uh, we start from here, of course, we have one, there is no, nothing in this code to be decoded. Then we have one, one, there's nothing to be decoded. Then we have one, one, zero, which is decoded as this one. Then we have one, one, zero, one, which is length four and there's nothing length four here. So we don't have to check any kind of ambiguity or whatever. So we come up with the result that this corresponds to A4. And then one zero comes, as you see, because there is no one, but there is one zero. And then uh, you may want to check if one zero one exists in the list and it does not. If one zero one one exists or not, there's nothing length for it, so it's impossible. So one zero was indeed the thing that you have to decode. There is no other way to decode this. And that is A2 and similarly, this one, one, one will be decoded as a four, and then one zero will be decoded as a two, then zero will be decoded as a one. You may want to check if zero one exists in the list and it does not, or zero one zero, and you see that in the list there is no such thing, and after that length four sequences come into the picture and there's nothing like that. So there's only one way to decode this, then we have one zero, which is A2, then one one zero, which is A3, then zero again, which is A1, then one one one, which is A4, and then zero again, which is A1. So you are capable of decoding it. This is an excellent code, by the way. Why is it, uh, uh, well, let me say it's a very good code. And, I, and I, it is excellent, but we don't know why it's excellent yet but it's very good. The reason for that it's very good is first check this average bit rate and compare it to uh, the, the number of bits that you need to uh, express uh, an experiment with four outcomes. So what, what is logarithm of four? Logarithm base two of four, it's two. So normally you need two bits for the representation of each symbol. And if you use two bits for each symbol, the average bits per two symbol would be two, not 1.75. 1.75 is actually less than that, it's smaller than that. There's another nice code that you can think of. That is code four. It's this zero, zero one, zero one one, and zero one 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 which gives an average of, as I calculate, 1.875. And it is, again, uh, uniquely decodable, but uh, not instantly decodable. Uniquely, but not instantly decodable. What do we mean by instantly decodable? As you may notice, wh while we are um, decoding this thing, we instantly, whenever we decoded, we instantly made a decision that it was A4 and then it was A2 and then um, A4 again and then A2 and then A1, etc. This is four, by the way. Um, so that was a, not only a, a uniquely decodable, but also an instantly decodable code. The other one, the code for uh, here, is uniquely decodable, but not instantly. You have to first trace around all of these sequences until the end. And then from the end backwards, later on, you decide what should be the result. There's, uh, you will notice that there's only one way to stack all these bits if you come up with uh, uh, these uh, symbols. Just make an example by yourselves using code four. Uh, say that it is A3 and then A2 and then A4, etc. You will notice that you will be able to decode, but not as easily as, uh, let's say, 
the first one. Because if you come up with zero, for example, you're not sure whether it is A1 or the beginning of any other one. But after that, you come up with maybe A1. But still then, you won't be uh, able to tell whether it is um, A2 or the beginning part of A3 or the beginning part of A4. You're not sure yet. So let me have one more bit, you say. And then let's say that you come up with a zero. And then you decide that, okay, it must be zero one, which corresponds to A2. And the next zero, again, ambiguous. It may be a zero of this one or this or this or this. So you look for one more uh, bit and then you notice that it's a one again. So you don't know whether it's this, this or this. And then you receive another one which is the which may be this or the starting point of this you're still not sure and then comes a zero then you understand that it was it has to be this and then you make a decision so it's this one is not uh, instantly decodable but you have to uh, wait a little bit more until the next symbol becomes obvious you can construct even worse codes than this one why would you do that anyway but you can where uh, you have to uh, wait until the end of the stream, not the next, until the end of the uh, symbol, that symbol, but you have to wait until the end of uh, the stream all the way. And then from backwards, you can decide uh, the, uh, the symbols. You can decode the symbols. Now here, the, uh, let's take a look at the entropy. And that entropy is, of course, uh, let's make an example about how to calculate numerically, uh, at least because previously I was only mentioning about P's and things like that. This entropy is equal to one over two times a negative of one over two times logarithm uh, one over two plus one over four times logarithm of one over four plus one over eight times logarithm of one over eight, plus one over eight times logarithm of one over eight. Okay, this is how you calculate uh, the entropy, sample entropy, let's say. You normally, probabilities are just expected values, but here they are given to you from some samples. And this is 1.75. Notice that this 1.75, is the same as this one. So there is something magical about this code. It is very efficient. That's why I first said it's an excellent code. It is indeed an excellent code because it reduces everything down to the entropy. And you cannot go below the entropy. Look at this. The average uh, bitrate here is 1.25. I don't even have to look at the symbols here. It is a zero, one, zero, zero, odd, zero and zero, zero, they are the same. So we cannot distinguish which is which. But without doing that, just look at the average bit rates and you can decide that it's not uniquely decodable, of course. And what uh, the Morse code falls into uh, is this problem, it is below the uh, entropy of uh, the English language or the Turkish language or any other language that you can think of, essentially. This is even worse, 1.125. That's a headache, of course. Th this cannot be um, decodable. Now, since we have such um, uniquely decodable codes, um, or we can construct those uniquely decodable uh, codes, let's jump into the excellent way of visualizing what makes a code uniquely decodable. What makes a code uniquely decodable. Actually, it is one way, but it's the best way to think of it. And that is uh, so-called binary trees. 
The binary tree is something like this. You have a root, um, and the, the, it's not the roots that have uh, the, the binary interpretations of zero or one, but it's the branches. And we have branches, which could be zero or one. And then each, we come up with another node, and each node may have further branches of zero and one, like this, zero and one. And for instance, this branch may further have two more branches of zero and one, and this branch may also have further zero and one. Now, the way that we construct a uniquely decodable code is just by uh, traversing from the root to the leaves. Uh, this is the root. And uh, let me list out a few of these symbols. The first uh, bit stream for the first symbol seems to be zero, zero, by just tracing from here, zero and then zero. And then zero and one is here, so that could be another code word. And then I have one zero zero, or let me put one one first, which is, uh, excuse me, here, one one. Then one zero zero is here, one zero zero. Then I have one zero one zero, and then I have one zero one one. Now, if you construct a binary tree like this, and if it is a full tree, what do we mean by a full tree? Uh, from a node, if uh, branches uh, are emitted, those branches will be in pairs. So uh, I go to both zero and one, not only to zero and then to uh, another zero and one or anything like that. If this is a full tree. It's not balanced, but it's a full tree. And if you come up with uh, this kind of a full tree, the codes here will be automatically, uniquely and instantly decodable. So that's why the, the first scientists of data compression science uh, thought of methodologies to construct it the binary tree. Because if you can construct a binary tree, then you are almost finished. You found it means uh, the uh, the uniquely decodable code, and furthermore, these binary when you uh, construct a full binary tree, they become efficient as well. Okay. An inefficiency happens if uh, something is missing. It means that you can prune the tree up to the uh, corresponding points. Let's assume that this one here did not exist. If this one here did not exist, then um, the symbol will be uh, zero, zero, of course. But why zero, zero? We don't have a zero, one for the ambiguity. And we don't have one. Therefore, the, the symbol must be replaced by these two must be combined. And we must stop at this node. And the symbol must be only a zero. Then. Why are you using a zero, zero? That would be redundant. But if you have this branch, then of course, zero, zero and zero, one will be two different um, things. The construction of the binary tree, however, depends on um, how efficient in terms of uh, the probability distributions you are constructing the tree. This is efficient, but only uh, for some kind of uh, a probability distribution. But for that probability distribution, if you come up with this uh, binary tree, this binary tree is efficient. That's what I can guarantee. But we may come up with a lot of efficient uh, binary trees and which one is the most efficient for our probability distribution? That's another question that we will answer very quickly. But if you have this kind of a tree, you can, even with these, you can start doing something. <clears throat> As you see, it is quite unbalanced. 
some uh, outputs are uh, longer, like four bits, this one. We have three bits here and some are short. So uh, the, the depth of the tree penetrates longer for some symbols. Isn't it, uh, wouldn't it be clever to assign uh, this node, this node, and this node to some um, more frequently encountered symbols. So let's use these two bits for the more probable things. Okay. And this one for the next uh, most probable, and these two for the least probable symbols. If you do that, even with a fixed uh, tree like this, you can have some good efficiency if your uh, probability distributions are not balanced. If your probability distributions are showing that some are more frequently encountered than the other one. Uh, when you come up with a binary tree, the uniquely decodability can only be spoiled if you assign uh, codes to some symbols, uh, not from the leaves, the, the, the end of the tree, let's call these the leaves of the tree, but uh, the branch nodes, for example, this one. If you assign this point to be uh, a code, which is one zero, as you see, this node is actually a prefix of the rest of the codes. So let me put it this way. This is a prefix of the other codes. So if a code is a prefix of the other codes, then the uniquely decodability is uh, spoiled for this construction style at least. You can still construct some uh, codes which uh, may be prefixes, prefixes of the other codes, then, but then you, it usually means that your tree is from bottom up, it's in the reverse order. Um, for instance, here in code four, as you see, A1 was a prefix of A2, and it's also a prefix of even A3 and A4 as well. And A2 is a prefix of A3. So as you see, there's, there seems to be a problem. But actually, this code is just another implementation of the same binary tree, but the bitwise, uh, Traversing, sequencing is just reversed. It's like this, uh, from here to here, zero, zero, then one, zero, then zero, zero, one, then one, one, zero, one, zero, one, and one, one, zero, one. So if you traverse from the back, then you will come up with this. Otherwise, it would be easier uh, for this one to be a non-prefix code. How? How can I do that? Uh, I don't have the necessary space for that, but I will try. Just think of this. This code is zero, the same. This code is one zero. This code is one one zero. And this code is one 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 zero, right? Then uh, no code is the prefix of another and it, it immediately becomes an uh, instantly decodable code. So the problem about code four was that it was rendered in the reverse order only, but it's still decodable at least, even if you render it that way. But it's not very much recommended. I do not recommend that you construct trees and then finally trace it from the bottom to top. That would be quite unnecessary. Just uh, from top to bottom will be the best uh, codes that uh, you will come up with. Now, according to my notes, all, um, before proceeding with uh, the so-called craft inequality and the, uh, the concepts of these uh, lengths, lengths of uh, codes, there is uh, an inequality that also gives us another proof about whether some code could be uniquely decodable or not. It must obey the craft inequality. If the craft inequality, we will see, 
is uh, satisfied with equality, it means it's the most efficient code, which uh, also helps, uh, which also lets us have uh, uniquely decodable codes. And those are the codes that we are looking for, by the way. But before that, I have a parenthesis here. And uh, here is a question. Uh, maybe I did it in the first uh, few minutes, but uh, maybe I did not, I do not remember. So let me repeat, uh, that, that's a, a good thing. There is an interesting uh, ar uh, argument. It's actually a theorem. It can be called a theorem because it can be proven. The argument is known as the counting argument. And uh, the proofs of these things depend on the so-called uh, discrete mathematics, which is a very helpful uh, mathematical tool for any kind of a, a student, a scientist that I would uh, recommend to. Uh, the, this discrete mathematics is the tool for compression. It's the tool for algebra. It's the tool for uh, algorithms. So it's, it's very nice. The counting argument is among that. And it says that no compression algorithm can uh, compress all data. Okay, that, there are some the, uh, if you have a compression algorithm, let's say that it is zip, right? You may notice this. Uh, sometimes you may have some uh, already compressed things usually that you try to compress further using again another zip. So let's zip it again or use another compression algorithm, let's say RAR algorithm, then to compress it again and then use zip again to compress it even further. It does not work that way. Uh, after the first compression, usually when you try to compress, the file size that you will get will be even is, is somehow slightly larger. Or if it is a, a PDF, for example, if it is already an efficiently saved PDF file, portable document format, when you try to zip it, you notice that the zip file is actually larger than the PDF file. So it's encountered, it's technically visible, but this is actually a theorem and it can be uh, proven. No compression algorithm can compress all data. And what is the proof? Again, such questions are questions of uh, concern for you to, uh, to encounter in, in the take home examinations, okay? But this one, again, I will do. Uh, the other one, I am asking you to find it. This one, I will do the counting argument, the proof of counting argument. And um, it, it's essentially like this. Let's think that, let's have um, size and uh, sources. What do we mean by size? And for example, 256 bits, okay? We are looking at only, not even all uh, data, I will show you that even a fraction of that data cannot be totally compressed. It's impossible to compress without loss, of course. I'm talking about one-to-one -one mapping of compression, uh, which means decodable completely and exactly decodable. Uh, uh, not all data, uh, it says, but I'm giving you that. Oh, I'm looking at only size and sources and bits. There are, of course, larger than n bit and infinitely many of them, but I'm not even looking at those. Let's look at uh, size n or n bit. Excuse me. n bit uh, data. Now, how many different such data can I have in total? How many of uh, those n bit data are available to me? We have a total of, total of, uh, two to the n uh, such data, right? This is the possibility. 
all the way from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, etc. 256 of them, if n is 256, uh, up to 1, 1, 1, 1, all of them are ones, and everything in between. So two to the n such data are available to you. And we, uh, we want to compress each of them to uh, less than n. So originally it was n bits, let's say 256 bits. We want to compress them. It could be 255 bits, which is possible, or 253 bits, 10 bits, one bit, down to one bit. Everything is possible for us, down to one bit. So all the uh, available slots that we can do is to reduce them to n minus one from n minus one down to one bit. Okay, we want to compress each of them to less than n bits from n minus one down to one bit. Now, how many um, such data do we have? With size n minus one, with size n minus two, with size n minus three, with size all the way down to one. How many? They are two to the n minus one for n minus one bit plus two to the n minus two for n minus two bit, two to the n minus three, all the way up to two to the one. Okay. This many. Uh, let's also add zero bits if you want to. You can even do that. But if you do this much of a summation, this is a power series uh, sum, which is given as, if you add plus two to the zero, two, which is one, you will have two to the n minus one. Without this, without this, it will be minus two, two to the n minus two, which is, this is less than two to the n, right? So we have two to the n possible uh, signals, possible data, possible files, and we want to compress it into a, 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 some slots which are less than two to the n. So we cannot find uh, from here to here, there cannot be, be a one-to-one -one mapping, right? It just does not fit. So we have two to the n minus one or minus two uh, different files in the compressed domain. And let's pick one of those compressed files, which of these two to the n different input sources would it correspond to? At least one of them would correspond to two things. Okay, it, does, it just does not fit. It is also known as the pigeon hole principle. If uh, the number of uh, holes in a community is less than the number of pigeons, then it means that at least two pigeons will uh, sleep at night in the same hole with another one. They just don't fit, it just uh, doesn't fit. Therefore, uh, not only all data, but all two to the n data cannot be compressed uh, because it just doesn't fit. And of course, <clears throat> this argument is uh, more stronger than that. For example, uh, how about the n minus one sized uh, signals? They also need to be compressed to n minus two or n minus three. So these will try to fit into this or into this or into this or into this furthermore. And this will try to fit into this, into that, into that for compression. So it's impossible. <clears throat> All data cannot be compressed because the compression 
domain is a smaller domain than the data variety that we have uh, for our uh, original files. So some of the files will not fit in there. So the art of uh, compression or compression uh, algorithm generation is an art of um, trying to find the reasonable a subset of these two to the n such data. If you remember in the beginning, I said that for images, there are two to the eight million different possible images, right? If you, you want to compress them, it won't be, uh, you won't be able to do that. But some images are the images of interest for us. They have their own uh, structure, the characteristics that when we look at them, we see something. Not a noise, not wrinkled noise, but something. So those something from images or those something from the data of length n, they are the ones that is important for you and you have to construct your compression scheme according to those important um, data. You, you, can, you just cannot compress everything. So since you cannot compress everything, why don't you compress the things that you want to compress? That is the thing that we will do uh, in this course. Now, uh, excuse me. Um, I want to check. Yeah, it's 1048 already. It's, uh, this was a long lecture, but it was uh, pretty much uh, fine. Um, let's meet at 10 past 11 and let's do another uh, course up to 12 o'clock. So I give a break uh, at this point. We will meet at, um, oops, 11, 10, okay, 10 past 11. Let's meet again at the same place. Until then, let's give a break. <laughs>